today's the second in a series of vision statements in which I'll be outlining between now and uh, next uh, May's budget. Uh, the framework from which Labor will be presenting our vision for what a Labor government would look like if we are successful at the next federal election. I was raised in a council house by a single mother on an invalid pension. So much of what mum did added up to one thing, her hope that my life would turn out better than hers. What I saw in her was what I would eventually learn was universal, the aspiration to lift others as we lift ourselves, to make life better for our families and our communities, to create a future you look forward to by improving the present, mm -hmm. and to do everything we can to make sure our children have opportunities and choices greater than what we had. This is a desire that doesn't distinguish between religion or ethnicity, postcode or bank balance. For some, it's the dream of raising the first generation in their family who goes on from school to higher education. For some, it's the dream of making enough money to become their family's first generation to pass on something to the next. There is also the great possibility that Australia represents to so many migrant families. To them, Australia is the promise of a better life. It is a promise with a powerful allure. It is a promise that drove my mum. It is a promise that I hope she saw realised in me. And it's a promise I hold for my own son. Labor is imbued with that spirit. One of our defining values is social mobility. Our movement was born at a time when your destiny was anchored to your social class. Labor's historic mission has been to sever that anchor chain. When I think about the path of my life, I recall that enduring promise of Labor. No one held back and no one left behind. What turns that aspiration into a reality is a strong economy. An economy that works for people, not the other way around. An economy that has enjoyed 28 consecutive years of growth, thanks to the happy accident of our natural endowments and the anything but accidental actions of the hawk keating Labor government. And despite the Coalition's declarations that recession was inevitable, the actions of two great Queenslanders, Kevin Rudd and Wayne Swan, ensured that our economy kept moving forward. An economy that is the beginning of possibility, the foundation on which everything else stands. An economy that delivers rising wages and living standards. But beneath the dead hand of a government in its seventh year, the foundations are beginning to crack. Our economic growth is at its lowest since the global financial crisis, with both the IMF and the Reserve Bank revising down our growth prospects. Our standard of living is flatlining. Wages are stagnant. Our unemployment rate is higher than the US, Britain, New Zealand and Germany. Our national debt has doubled. The annual interest bill on that debt alone stands at more than $16 billion. For that kind of money, you could build Sunshine Coast Hospital eight times over. Official interest rates are at their lowest in history, with the Reserve Bank even contemplating unconventional monetary policy such as quantitative easing. Productivity is actually sliding backwards. The accumulation of these economic indicators should be jolting us out of complacency. We can all take pride in our 28 consecutive years of growth, but we know that past success never guarantees the future. We should be planning how to address the coming economic challenges, but anyone hoping to hear about plans from this government of leaners is set for disappointment. As far as this government is concerned, the job is already done. Election one, mission complete. There is nothing left to do but a never-ending victory lap. But as history has shown, whether in sport or commerce, this approach is never sustainable. Australia cannot afford to rest on its laurels. Labor gets this, even if the government does not. Today I'll lay out the economic challenges that Labor will confront and our priorities. A plan based upon creating wealth as well as ensuring it is distributed fairly. Higher productivity, higher growth, higher wages, fairer outcomes. 
That will be Labor's economic agenda. We face a significant challenge from the structural changes taking place in the global economy. It has been over a decade since the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the onset of the global financial crisis. Yet the impact of the GFC continues to reverberate around the world. As Thomas Piketty outlined in Capital in the 21st Century, anyone with assets has done well, but inequality has worsened. While the wealth of the bottom fifth of households hasn't risen from the average of $35,000 since 2003-04, the wealth of the top fifth has risen from 1.9 million up to 3.2 million. A driver of inequality has been the historically low levels of the cost of money. For some countries, such as Germany, a large share of the bonds which are issued are now actually at negative rates. What was described as the Japan problem, low interest rates and low growth, is now much broader across advanced countries. And with debt, now effectively free, central banks are handcuffed. They are out of ammunition on interest rates, yet the government has relied upon them. But this is not just an, ec an academic exercise. It is reshaping returns in the global economy, particularly for labour and capital. Australia is not immune from these changes. Low interest rates assist borrowers rather than savers. It is precisely their mission to bring investment forward. But this has consequences for asset prices and especially for inequality, as the value for assets, for those fortunate enough to hold them, increases. But it also means that when savings are plentiful and the opportunities <coughs> for growth less so, firms restructure their balance sheets rather than engage in new investments. That's what we've seen happen in the United States. And this has implications for wage growth because labour productivity stalls. So put simply, those with assets have seen their wealth increase, while workers who rely upon their wages have struggled. The bottom line is that after a decade of low interest rates and low growth, the case for monetary policy as being sufficient is at an end. Monetary policy is a blunt instrument. It is not designed to do all the heavy lifting on growth and especially not over a decade. As the Reserve Bank Governor has repeatedly pointed out, we need a wave of reform on our supply side. It is entirely appropriate that I'm making this address here in the great state of Queensland, a state that's invaluable to our national prosperity. Queensland has both the largest area and the highest proportion of agricultural land in the country. Some 30,000 businesses engaged in agriculture it has developed a $23 billion tourism industry and 430,000 small businesses. Queensland is a great trading state with a mindset for getting ahead, including as the world's largest exporter of metallurgical coal and the development of the emerging rare earths industries. Look right across the spectrum. Resources and mining, primary industries such as beef, tourism, services, international students. And what you see is an open, outward-looking state. Queensland is exporting electric vehicle charging stations to Europe, energy management systems to Asia, mining services globally, as well as enhancing farming and agriculture with the use of biology, genetics and drones. Queensland universities and research institutes are working with commercial tourism operators to take advantage of a growing worldwide interest in unique, sustainable environmental experiences. In short, Queensland, like the nation, has the potential for a great future. And I am optimistic about Australia, as long as we get the settings right. I see a future that builds on our potential as a clean energy superpower, a future that realises our capacity to deliver the cleanest, most ethical food products in the world. A future based on the reserves of rare earths, the resources that will fuel this century the way that coal and iron ore fueled the last. And a future that leverages our expertise, quality and skills to provide the future services in tourism, education, infrastructure, urban management and human care. 
These are the opportunities that lie before us, but they are at risk of not being realised. At risk from a government that alternates between coasting in neutral or pulling us backward in what can most charitably be described as acts of passive regression. They have no plan. No plan for jobs, no plan for growth, no plan for higher wages. A failure to plan is a plan to fail. Australians are ambitious for their families, their communities and the nation. It is what characterises our go-ahead spirit, taking what has been handed down to us and improving on it. That's why we have one of the highest living standards in the world. Our desire to leave the next generation and the nation in a better state than we inherited. Our task is made that bit easier by the gift that geography has given us. At no time in our history has our location in the Indo-Asia Pacific region been such an asset. The tyranny of distance is giving way to the privilege of proximity. We sit at the apex of a region whose population is set to reach 3.7 billion within a decade, all within a flying time of 10 hours and a convenience of a shared time zone. The region is seeing literally the fastest growth in human history. And within that region are countries such as Indonesia and Vietnam, home to the world's fastest rates of economic growth and most rapidly burgeoning middle classes. We're also, of course, connected to India, the world's largest democracy, via its language, its institutions, its Australian-based diaspora, and indeed cricket. And of course there's China, which as it enters its next phase of development is increasingly demanding the sort of services and consumer experiences that prosperous middle classes desire. If we are to make the most of our natural endowments and geographical position, Australia has to engage in a productivity renewal project. Productivity is the key to economic growth, international competitiveness and ultimately rising living standards underpinned in large part by long-term sustainable wage growth. Which is why Australia's recent performance in productivity should be an urgent call to action. But instead we have a complacent government that far from using its power to help drive prosperity and the social mobility it fuels is asleep at the wheel. When Labor left office in 2013, annual productivity growth averaged 2.2%. Under the coalition, this rate has halved since then. But it gets worse because in the last two quarters, productivity has actually gone backwards we are in a productivity recession, with productivity missing in action. That old anchor chain of class and destiny threatens to make a comeback. Wages will remain flat and living standards will deteriorate. For parents trying to put a bit of money away for the annual beach holiday this Christmas, it is simply getting too hard after paying electricity and childcare bills. This is a point that the Reserve Bank and the business community continue to make. Our taxation system has shifted towards taxing labour more heavily than capital, reinforcing the concentration of wealth and growing inequality. Not only is this unsustainable, it is contrary to our national spirit. I want to lift our productivity horizon and do that in partnership with business, with the trade union movement and with civil society. I want the productivity debate to be much more than a one-dimensional focus on industrial relations and work, work practices. The fact is that workers have not benefited from the modest boost that there has been in productivity. We have an industrial relations system where enterprise bargaining is not delivering real wage improvements. And what's the response from the government? A government obsessed with attacking the fundamental right of trade unions to exist through measures such as the Ensuring Integrity Bill. This will exacerbate the problem, not solve it. Instead, I want to focus our productivity debate on managing the next wave of challenges. Challenges such as increasing wages, challenges such as population settlement and the management 
of our cities and regions so that the balance between working and family life is restored. Challenges such as climate change, energy and environmental sustainability. Challenges such as support for an ageing population and a health system facing long-term chronic conditions. Challenges such as tackling entrenched intergenerational poverty, particularly for those 320,000 jobless households with dependent children aged under 15. The priorities of our Productivity Renewal Project will be to lift investment in infrastructure, to lift business investment and to invest in the skills of our people. Public infrastructure creates short-term stimulus and jobs while boosting productivity in the long term. Our immediate priorities are clear. One, the confusion and inaction over energy policy must end, replaced with a clear mechanism and plan that will deliver the certainty necessary to drive investment in this sector. A shift to a clean energy economy will achieve a triple bottom line. More jobs, lower prices and lower emissions. Climate change is real, it is happening and it requires leadership. The early arrival and intensity of the current bushfire crisis should be a wake-up call for anyone who still questions the science. We can achieve real outcomes while benefiting jobs and the economy. Two, to support our future prosperity and productivity, Australia needs a high-speed broadband network built on more 21st century fibre, a network that revolutionises the delivery of essential services in health and education, but also unlocks the growth potential of our regions. Labor went to the previous election with a responsible and credible plan to address near-term concerns with the MBN. Come 2022, the country will need a long-term plan. And third, we need to plan now for Australia's future transport needs. It's no good doing what this government did. 18 months ago they announced the Urban Congestion Fund. Up to now there's been $17 million spent on it. Not on a road, not on a roundabout, not even on a sign. $17 million spent on TV ads in the lead up to the election. Not a single dollar outside of that $17 million has actually been spent on urban congestion. The fact is we need vision, such as high-speed rail uh, between Brisbane and Melbourne via Sydney and Canberra, which would bring regional communities closer to our capital cities and boost the case for regional business investment a decentralisation. This would be a natural continuation of Labor's strong record in infrastructure. Indeed, when I was Infrastructure Minister, with the support of a, a Treasurer, we doubled investment in roads right around the nation better roads that cut travelling times, boosted productivity and improved safety. We invested more in urban public transport than all previous governments combined, from Federation right through to 2007, including perhaps most proudly the Redcliffe Rail Link, first promised in 1895, <laughs> but actually delivered under our government. And we would have funded Cross River Rail, but the Abbott government cut the funding in the 2014 budget. We also built Gold Coast Light Rail, which made such a difference to amenity around the Commonwealth Games that were so successful held here. The provision of infrastructure must be a first order public policy priority. The government has this week responded to Labor's campaign by bringing forward some infrastructure investment, but most of it is still after the next election. What we need to do is to increase investment now. There's also a crucial role for the private sector. Indeed, we'll partner with them, including our $2.9 trillion superannuation industry, the legacy of a Labor government that never sat on its hands. And encourage that investment to go into domestic infrastructure and technology. That's just one of the reasons why the legislated 12% in superannuation is not only in the interests of workers, it's also in our national interest as a pool of national savings. Over the past two decades, the average age of Australia's capital stock has remained unchanged. In some industries, such as agriculture, manufacturing and accommodation, it has actually aged. 
we're not seeing the level of business investment needed to lift productivity. And this is when interest rates are at such historic lows. Faced with the challenge of weak business confidence, the best the Treasurer can do is to hector business leaders. That doesn't constitute a plan. I want to see business confidence restored and investment renewed. I want to see a tax system that gives businesses incentives to invest in themselves, both in better technology and equipment and in their workers. In that spirit, I again urge the government to introduce an upgraded investment guarantee as part of a measured economic stimulus package. Bring forward infrastructure investment combined with increased business investment will create jobs in the short term and lift productivity. But in addition to investing in infrastructure and, and business physical capital, the key to lifting productivity is investing in people. Crucially, investing in people must involve addressing the skills shortages that are a major handbrake on <coughs> productivity. We must repair our ailing vet system to tackle the steep decline in the number of Australians working towards apprenticeships. We need to make sure workers have transferable skills so they can move more easily between jobs. They also need to be able to upgrade and expand those skills as industries change. Having those skills will give them the confidence to face the future and the change that it will bring. We must foster an education, skills and training system that is fit for purpose. This is a priority that's so pressing that in Perth, in the first vision statement, I announced Labor's plan for a new legislative body, Jobs and Skills Australia, to do what Infrastructure Australia does for physical capital, to do it for human capital, for the skills of our people. A genuine partnership across all sectors, business leaders, governments, unions, education providers and those with expertise in particular regions. Labor's Productivity Renewal Project will restart the process of microeconomic reform and the forensic analysis of how economic activity is regulated and where changes have to be made. I've long been a champion of microeconomic reform. It was the approach that I took as Infrastructure Minister when I reduced the number of transport regulators around this country from 23 down to 3. And indeed the heavy vehicle regulator is based right here in Brisbane. Prior to this, separate maritime licences were required across state boundaries. The same rail signals meant different things depending upon which state you were in. And there were different widths and lengths of heavy vehicles permitted and even different numbers of cattle allowed on vehicles. From Queensland to New South Wales, 66 on one side, 60 to the other. I often wondered whether they offloaded six head of cattle when they got to the border. <laughs> this sort of nonsense needed to be fixed and we did it. Removing absurd red tape, returning a $30 billion efficiency dividend to the national economy over 20 years. It wasn't easy to get that through all the states and territories, but we were determined to do so. As the Productivity Commission has confirmed, Today's prosperity is due in large part to the microeconomic reform program undertaken by Hawke and Keating. From liberalising financial markets, removing tariffs and reducing protection through to competition policy, the microeconomic reform program of Hawke and Keating was unprecedented. What they gave Australia was the national leadership that is an essential ingredient in improving our productivity performance in what is a globalised, competitive world. Through the sheer power of their actions, they reminded us all that there is a natural and a central role for the state. But we've now reached the limits of the Hawke Keating reforms, and new challenges require new impetus. This reform agenda must also be complemented by sound fiscal policy. I want our economic framework to have a soft heart and a hard head. As the child of a single mum on the invalid pension, I appreciate the value of a dollar and the importance of managing money. When my mum went into hospital uh, for the last time, uh, I found out that her council house, or what was then a housing department house, was two months ahead in her rent because she always just put away every dollar. 
having grown up in that council house, I also know all too well the value and the big difference that government assistance can make to the lives of struggling families. Prudence and mutual obligation are values I learned growing up and they're values that I will take to fiscal policy with Jim Chalmers as the Treasurer and Katie Gallagher as the Finance Minister if we are successful. Like the Hawke-Keating government which turned around the budget by 4.8 percentage points of GDP, the equivalent of $90 billion in today's money, I will ensure that our investment tackles the real challenges that we face. Unlike the coalition which continues to float, float complete nonsense such as taxpayer subsidies for a new coal-fired power station that it knows full well will not happen, let alone nuclear power stations up and down the Queensland coast. They're treating the public like mugs. And unlike the coalition, which as the Parliamentary Budget Office has demonstrated, is intent on funding its fiscal consolidation through bracket creep to the tune of 0.5% of GDP. Labor's fiscal approach will instead be aligned to our economic priorities, which will first and foremost be to lift the nation to productivity. Just as Hawke and Keating used fiscal policy to respond to the terms of trade crisis in the mid-1980s, Rudd and Swan used fiscal policy to quarantine the nation from the shock of the global financial crisis. I agree with the Secretary of Treasury, who recently told Senate estimates that medium-term fiscal frameworks play an important role in contributing to a stable and predictable environment supportive of growth. And I agree with Deloitte Access Economics when it says that fiscal policy should be assessed in the context of its in impact on society's objectives of prosperity and fairness, including, importantly, intergenerational equity. Our fiscal priorities will be integrated with our long-term objectives to increase our productivity and, in turn, our living standards and social mobility. Can I say in conclusion that right now Australia is full of opportunity and with the Asian century we are uniquely poised to maximise our possibilities. But if we fail to get these settings right, the failure will not just be ours. It will be felt by generations to come. But we can get this right. Yes, Labor has learned the lessons from our recent mistakes. But importantly, Labor hasn't forgotten the lessons of our historic nation-changing successes either. Guided by our record and our enduring values, we look forward with confidence to the challenges and the opportunities of the economy of the future. Because we are the party that has consistently risen to them. I want to lead a fiscally responsible Labor government that invests with an eye firmly fixed on productivity. A Labor government that supports wealth creation as well as its fair distribution. A Labor government that supports microeconomic reform. We will never be content to just drift in the tide of good fortune, but we will do what Labor does best. Give Australians a strong, resilient economy from which all else flows. Australians are pragmatic, but they are not timid. They will grant a government a licence to embark on programs of progress and change, provided that government gets the economy right first. The economy is the starting point. At the beginning of this speech, I talked about how the circumstances of your birth needn't dictate the path of your whole life. That is the social mobility that is the heart of Labor's mission. Social mobility is born of opportunity. Opportunity needs a strong economy. A strong economy needs growth in productivity. And growth in productivity needs intelligent budgets and a progressive tax system that incentivises investment in capital and people. That is economic responsibility. That is how Australians will keep, that is how Labor will keep Australians from the old anchor of class and predetermined destiny. Now is no time to lower our aspirations. It's time to raise them and I look forward to working with you and my colleagues to that end. Thanks very much.